Good morning and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church, our worship service here on the 21st of March 2021. If you visit us in person, we'd like you to know that our time of fellowship has returned after the service, where you can have a snack and enjoy some conversation and get to know each other. Also returning is our Seekers class at 9.45 in the morning. Right now we have a great study on the book of Ecclesiastes chasing after meaning join uh, nancy rice and crew for that uh, at 9 45 on sundays coming up on april 1st is our monday thursday service at 8 p.m it will be a service of darkness and tenebrae and then we have our easter festival service with our seven preludes of Easter, which begin before the 11 o'clock hour. So come at 10.30 and enjoy that music, and then we'll have our Easter service. Earlier in the morning at 9.30, we'll have a uh, Easter breakfast, and we'll be serving that as a thank you to folks who donated to our technology fund that helps bring us into your home right like this. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. 
And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Come, let us worship the Lord of life. Let us worship God. Compassionate God, the wind of your spirit is the very sign of life for all who long for you. One breath from you and we are rescued from the arid valley of dry bones, given muscles and sinews and joy with which to praise you, and filled with the holy hope you grant to all your faithful children. Let our whole lives be filled with the life breath of the Spirit, that what has lain dormant may burst into bloom, and what looks to us to be death may be revealed as but sleep before the emergence of new life. Amen. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and one another. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and light of the world. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. This is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God.
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we were called as members of a single body. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Our New Testament reading today comes from 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, and which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as the first importance what I, in turn, had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the Apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, Indeed, stars differ from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are dust, and is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. 
Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, be movable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Here ends the reading of the epistle. Praise be to you, O Lord. We move now to Psalm number 30, Thanksgiving for recovery from grave illness. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. And you have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Our psalm for today. Thanks be to God. Hear now the reading of the gospel lesson, which comes to us from John 11. This is the story surrounding the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after his disciples, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death. But though they thought he was referring merely to sleep, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not going there so that you may believe but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, 
let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Mar Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, then his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of our Lord. Glory be to you, O Christ.
Please pray with me. Our Father and our God make us masters of ourselves, that we may become the servants of others. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. For we would see Jesus this morning. In his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Lent is a 40-day season of reflection, repentance, and renewal. Hard work days that seem to drag on and are about as pokey as the daffodils and for Scythia seem to be this spring and coming out to stay. But if you do the math, 40 days doesn't quite get us to the close of Lent. Ah, but we have to remember to count in the Sundays too. Every Sunday, even in Lent, is a day to remember with gladness the day of resurrection. Sunday is also called the eighth day of creation. For on this day, at dawn of the first day of the week, our Lord Jesus rose from the dead thus making a whole new creation out of death. God's act of recreation that recasts all things in eternal lines of grace. When the great cathedrals of Europe were starting to be built in the last days of the Middle Ages, and some of those cathedrals took over 250 years to build, the lines of each cathedral were constructed along a west to east axis. One entered from the west into the nave, a word from the Latin that is rooted in the word for ship, like an ark that is sailed on rough and stormy seas. The large expanse, the nave, led to the crossing, typically adorned with towers in the south and north, that led to the altar space in the east, where that table was set and communion was shared. The whole building forming the footprint of a cross that pointed east to the rising sun and the reminder that Christ arose as daylight dawned on that first Sunday long ago. <clears throat> I have an old friend from Seminary Chapel choir days, Pastor Richard Allen Farmer, who always signed off on his letters this way. I'm glad the tomb is empty, Richard. That should be a watchword for us, too. A greeting that we can share when the days are long on penitence and short on patience. When suffering seems to shout down the good sense of salvation. When reflection and renewal seems more like rejection and ruination. Wiley Stevens, the pastor of the Dunwoody United Methodist Church of Dunwoody, Georgia, has this to say about the story of Lazarus and Jesus. Our gospel reminds us that Jesus still shows up and Jesus makes a difference. Our story is one about when Jesus intrudes into death and brings life. He will not be held off or jerked about by death. His strong voice brings life. Whenever and wherever it shadows our arrangements with death in all our defeats, our surrenders, our fears, Jesus brings a new strength by his very presence. 
The timing for an Easter story such as Lazarus coming forth from death seems all wrong. Shouldn't we wait until Easter? But the reality is we can't wait. Whenever Jesus shows up, the dead come to life. Things open up, and there is Easter. Jesus makes so much of a difference that we are willing to make a dramatic affirmation like this. I believe in the resurrection of the body. Yes, sir. I'm glad the tomb is empty too. The one that Jesus once occupied, be clear. Not just the one he stood in front of and called into. And that is the critical difference. To affirm the statement, I believe in the resurrection of the body is to make a strong statement about the value of life. That our life is not only worth living in this life, but that we have eternal value, eternal worth. When Jesus heard that his friend Lazarus was dead, he wept. Not simply for the loss of life, but for all those who wept that Lazarus was gone, the people who loved him, like Jesus, but who didn't know that tombs could be emptied with a word. To believe in the resurrection of the body is to affirm that life, with all its ups and downs, sadness and hurts, joys and sorrows, hopes, outworn and dreams deferred is still worth living. To offer these words of the creed, attached as they are to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, is to say that there is no one that cannot be raised to a new life. That no hope is outworn, no dream dashed, as long as Jesus is the one who is standing out in front of the tomb and calling into it, come out! We can live in a new way when we are both aware that he is with us and we can trust our very lives with his guidance. Bishop Will Williman, in his book, Resident Aliens, Life of the Christian Colony, wrote that this story demands an offensive rather than a defensive posture by the church. The world and all its resources Anguish, gifts, and groaning is God's world. And God commands what God has created. Jesus Christ is the supreme act of divine intrusion into the world's settled argument. In Christ, God refuses to stay in his place. We claim from this story the power of Jesus to call us out where we are buried, buried in our fears, our pain, our grief, our worries, life's pressures. Hey, did you hear that one sentence in particular? Jesus Christ is the supreme act of divine intrusion into the world's settled argument. It is the key 
to the affirmation we make in saying, I believe in the resurrection of the body. The divine intrusion into the world's settled argument is that dead does not mean much when God is at work. The settled argument, the settled argument is that dead is dead. Like the words Charles Dickens used to describe Jacob Marley. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that of my own knowledge, what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. <laughs> but the divine intrusion says the wisdom of the ancestors has the perspective all wrong. The divine intrusion says that when the tomb is emptied from the inside out, then death itself has been put to death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? To affirm the belief in the resurrection of the body is to give assent to the belief that God loves life. God is a flesh and bones God, says Pastor Chuck Warnock. We tend to over-spiritualize Jesus. That is what Martha is doing in the story from John's Gospel in recounting the raising of Lazarus. She makes of Jesus' words a, a theological proof. But the Lord is trying to ground her in the very present moment. What do you make of this statement in the living of your own life? Do you take Jesus' words and spiritualize them too, like Martha? Be careful when you do that because you just might take them right out of the context of your present hard scrapple life where they are meant to weep with you and love you and live and work for you and with you day by day. Do you wonder why the words, I believe in the resurrection of the dead follows after belief in the forgiveness of sins. It is to announce the complete redemption guaranteed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That death does not have the final word. Jesus does. There are many times in our lives when the crosses he asks us to carry in life weigh particularly heavy. Are they ever really light? When the dangers, toils, and snares feel like so many pieces of ironmongery driven deep. When death takes loved ones too soon. When the path we have taken seems more of a wilderness, dark and 
deep when another day seems too much like a good Friday of crosses thrown up over our heads. Just then, in times and places like that, we find Jesus extending his hands to pull us close to himself. He speaks a strong word to us if we're willing to listen. <clears throat> I know, son. I know, daughter. It feels like Good Friday in your heart and in your life just now. I've been there too. But I am here with you, come what may. And believe me when I tell you, Sunday is just around the corner. Yes, I too am glad his tomb is empty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>us all join in the familiar apostles creed our affirmation for today i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remember the people who have been listed in our bulletin that you have received. Those of you who are on our email list to receive it, if you would like to receive a copy of the bulletin ahead of the service, please write to us uh, and tell us that at covenantbutler.org or at covenantoffice at zoominternet.net. And we'll see that you get a bulletin to follow along. So the names are there. And we ask you, of course, to have your own names ready for the prayers we pray. Let us go before the throne of grace. As God's people called to love one another, let us pray for the needs of the church, the whole human family, and all the world, saying, hear our prayer that churches of all nate traditions may discover their unity in Christ and exercise their gifts in service of all. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer, that the earth may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and the air, soil, and waters cleansed of poison. We pray to you, O God, Hear our prayer. That those who govern and maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in obedience to your commands. We pray to you, O God. Hear our prayer. That you will strengthen this nation to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled the young educated and the old cared for the hungry filled and the homeless housed and the sick comforted and healed we pray to you O oh God hear our prayer that you will preserve all who live and work in this city of Butler and the surrounding communities, that they may all live in peace and safety. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. That you will comfort and empower those who face difficulties or trials, who are sick, and disabled who are in rehabilitation. We pray for the poor, the oppressed, those who grieve, and those in prison. We pray to you, O oh God, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who we bring before you now in the silence of these moments. Heal them in body, mind, or circumstance. We pray to you, O oh God, hear our prayer. That you will accept our thanksgiving for all faithful servants of Christ now at rest, who with us await a new heaven and a new earth, your everlasting kingdom. We pray to you, O oh God, hear our prayer. Merciful God, as a potter fashions a vessel from humble clay, you form us into a new creation. Shape us day by day through the cross of Christ your Son until we pray as continually as we breathe and all our acts are prayer. Through Jesus Christ and in the mystery of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. 
And now join me as we pray for the coming of the kingdom as Christ the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. prayer of dedication. O oh God, accept our offerings and use us to bring life and health and hope to your world. Make us generous and faithful stewards of your mysteries, doing your will and proclaiming your word. Through Christ we pray. Amen. And now, my friends, as you make your Lenten journey, be strong in witness to your faith. Be diligent in your study of God's word. Seek the truth and cultivate a humble heart. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through. May all our spirits, souls, and bodies be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. 
the one who calls us is faithful and God will do it. Amen.